Hello everyone, back again. Haven't uh, put any videos up in a few days. I've been intrigued by this Magnus Carlsen, uh, Sergey Karyakin match, and uh, there were quite a string of draws, and I didn't uh, I feel like annotating all of them. Some of the games were <clears throat> a little bit dull, and uh, some of them I just quite frankly didn't understand, so I didn't just want to throw up some videos just to, you know, just to keep <clears throat> pace with the games, but uh, finally, Magnus uh, lost, dropped the ball yesterday, but uh, I still think that he's going to uh, beat Sergey Karyakin, um, and I think he just suffered from overconfidence, because he definitely um, could have easily drawn that, but uh, it's probably frustrating and just, you know, pushed a little bit too far. But hey, that is a personality trait, and Karyaki might have picked up on something there. So, but anyway, uh, what I do want to share with you is uh, a few games. I'm going to show, or try to show two games today. And the theme is the positional pawn sacrifice. So, uh, this is a great arsenal and tool to, to know about in chess. And uh, I'm going to show you two fantastic games uh, featuring it. Okay, so this first game is uh, from 1998. Uh, and it's between Grandmaster Igor Kenkin, who was 25-65, if that matters to you. <laughs> and uh, uh, GM Ian Rogers, uh, who was rated 25-70 at the time. So the game started out D4, C5. I don't want to go too fast. This is a, a Bononi. This is a old Bononi. Uh, normally, um, the Bononi would start with uh, Knight F6 first, and then after C4, and then C5. And then you get D5, etc., etc. Now, the difference between the two is that with the old style Benoni, D4, C5, and D5, of course, <clears throat> white has the option to play his knight to C3, which can be very dangerous, uh, dangerous to black. So this is why in a modern Benoni, black waits to white commits his pawn to C4 first. One of the reasons, anyway. But so C4, C5, D5, and now E5. Now this is a rarely seen Grandmaster level, and this is known as the uh, uh, Czech Benoni, I believe. And this leads us to like a blocked, blockaded position. But have no fear. If you understand the basic principles of uh, closed positions, then you really can play through this also. Like if you understand the French advance uh, structure or Carol, closed Carol Khan structure, Carol Khan advance structure, you can play this position also. It's just another closed uh, system. So D4, E5. Of course, White can take with the ampersand, but it would be detrimental to his position just to lose this wedge in its center at this point. <clears throat> Normal development <clears throat> with E4. And D6. And one of the general principles uh, about closed positions in general is that one of the uh, main things that you're trying to do is find a um, uh, open <clears throat> uh, area to open files or a break point, so to speak, for the rooks. And if we look at this position, we see that if we look at the uh, white position, there's two places that white could attempt to make a break. One is by playing f4, and the other is engineering <coughs> b4 <coughs> at some point. Whether it's c3, b4, or e3, b4 after c4 has been played, that's, that's going to be one of the break points, b4 or f4. If we look at the black position, this is Black's break right here, F5. So Black's game is usually geared around achieving this F5 break. 
and also expanding on the king side uh, on the queen side rather with a6 and b5 is another plan uh taking a lot of space but we're talking about breaks here so the breaks here the break here for black is is f5 <clears throat> <clears throat> so with that in mind let's let's continue this should be five check it's acceptable move and this move ser serves to uh, retard blacks development knight d7 of course bishop uh, d7 can be played but again another uh, strategic motif is that of good and bad bishop notice that all of um, blacks bi blacks pawns are on dark squares here in the center and this bishop has been made bad this dark square bishop whites blacks good bishop is his light square bishop so playing bishop d7 is almost somewhat like a strategic uh, concession here in that this white bishop is white's quote unquote bad bishop as it's block would be blocked behind these pawns if it weren't on this square so <clears throat> a trade of these two bishops would favor uh, white there and that's it wouldn't be that white's winning but it's just a strategic uh, gain for white another thing also is after bishop d7 white does not necessarily have to capture right away for instance bishop d7 and then a move like queen d3 just making it hard for black to develop the knight can't go here if the knight wants to come out the knight has to come here and if he wants to get that in he could play a6 and kind of provoke the trade so the bishop b5 check knight d7 and again we see the knight is pinned here and it kind of retards black's development on the queen side a4 is played and a4 has kind of uh, the idea of course protecting the bishop from maybe any tactics involving queen check here and capturing although the knight can come here right now he might want to move the knight somewhere else and but besides protecting the uh, bishop in a4 it anticipates the plan of a6 and b5 down the road where b5 will be problematic due to a capture from the a pawn so a4 is played black seeing that he goes for his other plan the g6 and again this is the major break for black knight c3 remember I mentioned that earlier that that's one of the options white has when black plays c5 so early he doesn't have to place a c4 followed by knight c3 so he conserves a tempo by just bringing the knight to its most natural square <clears throat> now the other idea behind f5 but excuse me behind um, g6 besides pushing f5 is to trade this bishop off now remember I told you this bishop was bad being blocked in by its own pawns so this is one of the main ideas that happened in this opening is this bishop will come to h6 and that's what uh, Ian Rogers played here um, Igor Kankin played bishop takes h6 and knight takes h6 so now he trades off uh, his good black bishop but it's not just to um, help black develop he's actually uh, gaining time and he's playing against his plan of f5 so now the queen d2 the knight is attacked and there will be no f5 here knight g8 just flat out losing uh, the tempo and notice how even though black gave up his dark square bishop he uses the queen 
as a bishop in this instance to dominate those dark squares on the diagonal from c1 to h6. Now, here's the break. Remember I told you about white's two breaks. He could either went for this f4, excuse me, b4 break or this f4 break. So he opts for f4. E takes f4. Now we see one of the other benefits of this move bishop to b5. By holding this pin on the knight, it keeps the knight from entering e5. So after queen takes f4, queen, queen f6, <clears throat> and of course, uh, black would love to have white help him with his development by playing queen takes f6 and followed by knight takes f6. And uh, black would be a okay. I mean, white could only claim the smallest of the smallest advantages. But after the move queen g3, the queen is left left somewhat stranded here on the open file that is soon to be occupied by the rook. Remember that theme with closed those closed and locked positions. You know, remember the idea of breaks and opening a file for your rooks. So after queen g3, h5 was played. And notice the difficulty that black is having um, <clears throat> coming up with any type of real fluid counterplay. His queen being on f6 also hinders this idea of f4. And notice now that he's played h5, he's pretty much abandoned the idea of coming with f5. Okay, so castles queenside, h4, queen to e3, queen to e7, trying to hinder this advance, and notice again how this powerful the pin is of this bishop, because that knight is rendered uh, null and void. And it's not really guarding e5. Sorry about that. So knight f3. And look how natural and wholesome white's position looks. It's two pawns in the center. Knights on their natural squares, f3 and c3. And all he has, he has one rook on d1. And all the other rook has to do is come into the game. Whereas black is very far behind in development. And we all should know that if we have a lead in development, we should try to open the position because a lead in development is a temporary uh, situation and that if we waste time, our opponent can catch up in development and uh, neutralize any advantage in that area. So this is one of the benefits with closed positions is that you can fall behind in development. If the opponent can't break open the position, then your uh, lack of development doesn't really matter because you'll eventually catch up. However, this position is quite dangerous as we do have an open f-file now. And we have this knight pinned. So e5 is is, um, is definitely on the table for, for white and something that he would love to do. Black plays knight gf6, which is a mistake. And he has the idea of anticipating e5 by playing the move knight g4. So e5 is played. Knight g4 hitting the queen. Queen d2. And knight g takes e5. So I know some of you are saying, wait a minute, didn't white just lose a pawn? Doesn't that work out for black? This is the theme that uh, I opened the video with. This is what is called <clears throat> a positional pawn sacrifice. It is not that uh, Grandmaster Kenkin did not see the idea. He saw the idea, knight gf6 e5 and knight g4 he saw that 
but in order to get the open position right to fully exploit his lead in development because if you look at the pieces all of white's pieces are developed save this rook on h1 and look at black's development look at those rooks terrible bishop on c8 terrible white understands if he can open the position then the game will be over shortly since black's position will collapse so here's the sacrifice the sacrifice is a positional one just to open up the position so e5 exclamation mark knight g4 queen d2 knight g takes e5 so he's a, he says hey here there's your pawn take it now watch what happens Knight takes e5. Notice again, we've been talking about this pin on this knight the whole game. If this knight could capture here, black is in the driver's seat. But he's pinned. He can't. And he can't take with the queen. Because that rook will come flying to e1. Right? Faster than you can blink your eye. And it would uh, pin the queen to the king. So, d takes e5. So you might say, hey, wait a minute, the position is still closed. D6. Hitting the queen. Now the pieces start flooding in. And you'll see quickly how fast black's position falls apart. So after queen E6, knight D5. And now we're threatening the fork here. <clears throat> King F8. Now you might be saying, "Hey, why didn't why didn't Black just castle here?" Well, if he castles, there's a lot of weakness around the dark squares here, and then White can just make another sacrifice of the Queen D6. Queen takes D6, and move like Rook H F1, and let's say I don't know A6. Bishop takes D7. Bishop takes d7 and knight f6 and then black has to give up the queen in order to stop mate. So king f8 is played and then <clears throat> white played queen g5. <clears throat> now you might say hey why didn't he just fork the king and queen excuse me the rook and the uh, queen. If knight c7 then queen a2 threatening mate here and after queen and <clears throat> the g5 we'll get a transposition to what we see in the game so white play queen g5 first rook b8 now to get out of that fork i just mentioned knight c7 attacking the queen now even stronger was utilizing that open file that I mentioned earlier was the purpose of playing f4 is just getting that last piece in the game so for example if rook h5 attacking the um, queen and queen d8 check and then say after queen e8 then black excuse me white can win in several ways he could uh, play queen takes e8 check or queen c7 attacking the rook black is just totally busted and after say king g7 again bishop takes d7 and if bishop takes d7 then the rook drops and if queen takes d7 then the protection of f6 is lacking and then after queen f6 king h7 knight e7 queen e8 and then just simply queen takes f7. <clears throat> so rook h f1 was the strongest move. But king can play another good move. And knight c7. Attacking the queen. And at this point. Um, there's several ways to win. And king can just goes in for the ending. So queen takes f6. Knight takes f6. And d7 just picking up the piece. And that's a horrible way for that bishop to end. 
in this career. And uh, White basically just went on to win a piece up. Okay. But yeah, I'll just show you the moves real quick. <clears throat> Again, just being a piece up. There's no problem for uh, Grandmaster Kankin just to convert. Now you see it's two pieces up. And uh, valiant effort by uh, GM Rogers here. But it's just too much firepower. And after night A5... The 41st move, he resigned. But, again, the main theme of, of the game that I wanted to show you, besides giving you a little lesson about the breaks and um, close position, was that positional pawn sacrifice. 15 E5 here. Position, being ahead in development, and then finding a way to um, bust open the position so that your pieces can spring to life. And just notice how quickly after E5, the position just collapsed and it was over just just like that matter of five more moves now just to be fair instead of knight f6 black has to play a move like f6 to really try to put the clamps down on a move like e5 there now he's still you know in trouble here positionally but that gives them a little more time to try to keep the position uh, closed here so, for instance, white could play a5 so that he can maintain the bishop there. On b5, a6, bishop a4, king f7, breaking the pin. And now, say, a move like g3, trying to break open the position. And say, black tries to keep it closed with h3. And then we still have a game ahead. And, again, the themes are still the same. White will be trying to break open the position. And black has to keep it closed because he's way behind the development. He has to keep it closed as possible, as much as possible, until he can try to catch up uh, somehow in development. Okay, so now I'm going to show you one more uh, game. Okay, now our next game is from the immortal, in my opinion anyway, Mikhail Botvinnik. This game is from the Varna Olympics. 1962 and his opponent with the black pieces was Arturo Salamanca Pomar and again keep in mind our theme is the positional pawn sacrifice and in my opinion um, it's great to study these old games because you can you can see where these ideas come from that seem so routine nowadays so let's learn so Bafinic started with one of my favorite uh, openings to a chess game is g3 and I made a video a few weeks ago about opening preparation and uh, avoiding opponent's preparation this is a great way to do it but you have to have to know um, you know know something about chess to play like this but anyway that's another topic but he started out g3 d5 Pomar plays classically here take just takes the center Nothing wrong with it. Knight f3. <clears throat> Excuse me. C5. Bishop g2 was played here. Knight c6. D3. E5. And what do we have here? We have a King's Indian defense, right? Reversed so we can call it the King's Indian attack and that's exactly what it is But this is uh, if you reverse this with the white pieces you have your classic King's Indian So castle Bishop d6 And there's e4 there's white getting his representation in the center and again This is exactly how you would play it <coughs> with the black pieces D4, black takes the space. Knight BD2. And knight G E7. So here we see that black is not playing the, the uh, classical knight of six, but that he's planning on using his F pawn some uh, in some capacity. Perhaps to play a move like F4 
or bolster his center with f6 and then play in the Yugoslav or Samish, right? A, re a reverse Samish attack with f3 with the idea of uh, playing g4, h5, h4, h5, h4, etc., and storming and ripping open the king's side position. Sometimes f6 is played with the idea of putting this bishop here and not having to worry about being attacked. And then placing the queen behind the bishop, castling queen side, trading off the bishop, and just attacking the heck out of the white queen side. Now, again, recognizing this position, we can classify this as a pretty much a closed position. The pawns are interlocked in the center, and there's no open files. So we have to consider breaks once again, because it's, it's the pawns, as Philidor said, of the soul of chess. Again, if we look at the white position, this is one of white's breaks, f4. And if you were black, that's why black plays f5. This is one of the key breaks. But it's not mandatory that you play here, that's the, but this is uh, one of your key breaks. So we get that f4 in. And the other break is here. Those are your two breaks. Now, you could play and try to get this one, but this one is hard, harder to get. Like you could try a you know a three b four or in the reverse, but these are your main two breaks. If it was black, it would be c six and f five. But here, it would be c three and f four. And of course, you have to weigh the advantages and disadvantages. For instance, one of them, one of the disadvantages in going for the c three break is is possibly this backward d pawn, which might be might or might not be a problem later. And this is why you have to have good chess understanding when you're playing these kind of openings. If you're looking at the black position, again, f5 is a, a possibility for a break. Uh, there's, um, and also on the queen side, getting in c4. Again, now we're looking at that and analyzing that more. It's a little, maybe a uh, little bit more difficult to get have to be prepared somewhat maybe with uh, a6 b5 c4 etc but those are the ideas and with black having more space on the queen side uh, the position may dictate that his play be on the queen on the queen side but having a space advantage uh, that he does and this position allows you to play on both sides of the board so it's a rich, a rich position filled with opportunity. So let's go on and let's see uh, what Botvinnik plays next. So in this position, Botvinnik plays c4. So he locks the position up. And I say locks the position up because, yes, uh, black could play d takes c3, but he's just hurting himself in this position. By just uh, opening, opening, uh, you know, getting rid of his center, um, and eventually, uh, White is going to be able to push forward. He's going to use this open file to attack, and it's basically he's just giving White squares for nothing. This pawn is not going to be a problem because eventually, this queen is going to move to say a4, and then this rook is going to be on d1. So, c4 is played by Botvinnik, and now the position is really, really locked up. But again, analyzing the breaks, this is one of them. So, by pushing c4, it does make a break easier for black to achieve. So, for instance, play could go a6, you know, with the ideas like b5. So maybe B3 or even some circumstances taken here, but all of this has to be prepared and analyzed. But anyway, those are the breaks. But one of the ideas is that um, in C, behind C4 is that White White definitely wants to play on the king side. So basically, he's using this to kind of jam up, you know, or slow down Black on the queen side here. So, for instance, if black did get a6 and b5 in, 
white would probably just play b3 and just try to keep things as slow as possible on the queen side okay so f6 so now we have a reversed Samish variation or Zamish variation I think that's the proper pronunciation of the king's Indian defense again understanding the position knight h4 now I've explained to you what the where the breaks were and what the ideas were now you know that now you can understand why why knight h4 is played because we have to free the f pawn to achieve this break okay that's what it's about bishop e6 again i've explained the position enough so you know what that's about you know in a perfect world black would love to play queen d7 castle queen side play bishop h3 trade off the bishop play h4 g h5 g5 etc also for those of you wondering g5 is not acceptable at this point not not right now anyway because of that and black would have black is not lost here but you know have a funky position after you know after king d5 king d7 excuse me bishop e6 is played and now Bavinik played f4. Thematic. He's just playing along with the position here. So now he takes f4. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, why not just keep the tension or something? Just castle. Castle is possible, but then this kind of exacerbates, this kind of, um, I was going to say exacerbates, this kind of helps uh, white in his uh, positional goal. So after f5, right, the bishop got to move somewhere. And then get ideas like this with this uh, pawn storm um, coming because white is going to then restructure his position, maybe move the knight back here and then play h4 and build up for the g5 push. Notice with this, now with this pawn structure, right, now the break is here. So everything switches now with this. So now the F5 has been closed, but the break, now here's your next break. So your whole strategy was switched to where you're playing same moves like King H1, wherever it's safe at. Maybe the bishop will go here to F3 because the bishop is really bad now. Rook will come to G1. This knight will probably drop back H4 and then G5. You see those plant, those ideas come to, to my head um, immediately. The reason why is because I understand the position. And that's how you're gonna think. You're not gonna think in terms of opening. You're gonna you're gonna see the pawn structure and boom. Then you'll know you'll you'll have the general ideas. And of course you have to analyze, but you'll have the general understanding. You won't feel like lost at sea. <clears throat> so let's get back to to the game. So Pomar decided, okay, hey, I'm going to take right now. E takes F4. G takes F4. And now we see, of course, the open G file. Queen, C, uh, queen C7. And and I know I showed you Queen D7 before. Queen D7 is, is uh, you know, definitely possible. Nothing wrong with queen d7. And again, keep in mind, we're talking about breaks. Because I explained to you when, after the f5 move, that the next break for white would be g4, g5. Now, in this position, it's still here. He gave up this this break. to, to uh, Remember, I was talking to you about c6 earlier. He gave up that break when he played c4. This break still remains. But, he would, of course, he would have to prepare it. a3, and say rook, rook to b1 b4 etc but queen but for black queen d7 is is possible he decides on queen c7 because he says i'll attack this pawn with tempo notice he's attacking the f pawn twice the rook is defending it once and at the same time his idea is the castle queen side with the same ideas g4 
excuse me, G5 and and Storm open open this up. Open the G file up and you know attack. So here is our lesson for today. The theme. Right? So with all all of those things right on the line. In other words, if white wastes time here, if white wastes time here, then um black will open up this position to his advantage because black has uh um powerful pieces that are just being held back by this curtain of pawns right here. If black can somehow break through this curtain of pawns, uh white is white is going to be in trouble. Okay? And white has to somehow figure out how to get his pieces active. His king side pieces are alright, but look at his queen side pieces. Right? So what white does here E five. So he kills he kills the activity of black's pieces with that move. And now if you look that again, if you looked at some of my old videos, Nimzovich gives three main reasons for a central pawn advance. And one of them is to demobilize the opponent. So check this move out and you judge for yourself what it did. So demobilization, think of that. So E5 is played. Sacrifice, positional sacrifice. Right? <clears throat> and what is and what is Botvinik getting for this sacrifice? I'll tell you. One, because this is a lesson after all, right? I can't keep you in the dark. Right? What does he get? One opens this diagonal for the piece. So his bishops bishops no longer blocked, right? That's a plus. <clears throat> Two, the E four square. Look at it. Now the knight can go here. Let's look let's go back right before this move. Look at the knight. The knight is kinda just hanging out with really no nothing to do. Now if the E five, the knight can go here. Bishop, Bishop's diagonal is open, and the third thing he does, he demobilizes the opponent. In other words, Black cannot use the e5 square. Okay, all of that for the cost of a pawn. So he pays the price. F takes e5, and now here's a critical decision. Now, of course, after I said all of that, you can't play this move. Because then, black's pieces open up against, look at this, open up against the white position with great wrath. So we can't do that. Again, think demobilization. F5, exclaim. Now notice, the pawn cannot be captured because it's guarded twice by the rook on F1 and the knight here. So the bishop is attacked. And notice, this pawn is blocking the action of the bishop and queen. And since this bishop is attacked, black doesn't have time to counter-sacrifice and play this move. Okay? And nowadays, a sacrifice like that will be considered commonplace, but it's because of games like this, 1962, that opened the eyes you know, of the chess world. Because when you're just beginning to play in chess and you give up a pawn, you want to get something right away for it. Like you sacrifice a pawn, you want mate afterward. <laughs> you know, you just sacrifice a pawn, you want checkmate. You know, you know, or you, oh, you want a piece. You want you want the pawn as queen. You know, you just gave a pawn. You want something tangible right then and there. No, this is about position. This is a positional sacrifice. In other words, you're not getting nothing back right away. You're just getting some squares, you know, and some room room for your pieces. And then you gotta still do work after that. This is deep this is deep chess. This is going into to the deep waters. So Bishop F seven gotta gotta preserve the bishop. Now, immediately occupying the square, right? The blockade square. It's another concept of Nimjovich, but we're not gonna get too deep into that. But he's blockading and what is he blockading? Now this pawn is stuck here on e5. See, so he can't counter sacrifice. So now it's blockade. And now look how much force the knight 
is radiating into the position. And this is why they say knights are better than, than, than bishops in closed positions. Because bishops and rooks need open, um, open diagonals and open files and ranks. We can probably say in this position that these knights are more valuable than the rooks and bishops. Look at this rook. This, look at, actually, look at all four rooks in the position. Three of them aren't doing anything. And this rook on f1 is doing something because of that positional sacrifice. So that positional sacrifice not only opened it up for the knight, the bishop, but also this rook. Okay? So let's keep going. So that was a great, uh, great sacrifice. But they, look how powerful the knights are. The knights radiate into the position. Castle queen side. Great move by Botvin at queen g4. There's two threats here. One is f6. Check. Right? Notice the position of the king on c8. And the position of the queen. And remember, I always talk about opposition. You can line up against the queen or king or something like that. So here's a threat. Just this basically winning the knight. And also the take here. King b8. Bavinet grabs the pawn. Queen takes g7. It looks risky. Because you say, wow, can he just, you know, hit the uh, queen? But he does it with tempo. Notice this bishop right here. F7 is unprotected. So he's able to grab it. He's able, I call that stealing. When you're able to go into the enemy territory, it looks kind of dangerous. And just grab something like that. Okay. So now he's got that pawn. Now he has a pass pawn. Because that g pawn was blocking you know, the advance of the F pawn. So now he has a pass pawn. Right? So he got the pawn back, but naturally, he didn't go out his way trying to get the pawn back or ruin his position. Right? The pawn basically fell into his lap as a result of his positional superiority. And I use that as a segue into what um, Capablanca or, uh, said back in the day is in assessing the position always position first then material right worry about the position the material will take care of itself then okay so bishop h5 so he has to protect his bishop but there's also a threat and like i said when you're playing defense try to attack at the same time and what's the threat here can you see it just here bishop e2 picking up this guy right here attacking the rook at the same time Therefore, rook f2 is played, h6, and now bishop d2. So, Bavinik is basically trying to just complete his development. You know, these pieces on the queen side been out the game um, for a long time. So, bishop d2, excellent, excellent move. Getting all the pieces involved. Rook D, G8, there it is. Black's been wanting to play that for a while. Queen F6. Knight C8. Now Knight G6. And now he just blocks the action of the Rooks. Bishop takes, F takes. And now the pass pawn moves up. And, and it's funny too because... It's like the pass pawn and then the events of the pass pawn and switching the files are all been basically forced, right, due to the superiority of white's position. So bishop e7, queen f7, and I'll show you the rest of the game. Again, I wanted to show you that major theme in those two games of the positional pawn sacrifice, but... For sake of completeness, I'll show you the rest of the game here. So knight d8 was played, attacking the queen. Queen dropped back. Bishop h4 attacking the rook. Rook f3. Knight e7 attacking the queen and the pawn. Uh-oh. Now, again, black wins the pawn, right? He gets the pawn back. But... White has fully mobilized all, his, all of his forces, right? So, again, position, then material. So, yes, 
the material right the material uh situation is uh is uh changed right blacks feeling good about that but the positional situation is going to be in white's favor so queen h3 knight takes g6 there's knight f6 And keep in mind about the breaks I told you about. So, for instance, a move like Rook G7. Remember the break? Okay, so now it's playable. Increasing pressure against this square. So, anyway, this bishop takes F6 was played. Rook takes F6. Queen e7. Now, queen g7 might have been a little bit stronger here. And I actually like that for black. Queen g7 and rook f2 because of this situation right here. So, queen e7 was played attacking the rook. And simply rook a f1. And I think I think the position here favors white, but I just think you know slightly here. Um, and the only reason why I say slightly is because positionally white is better, but black has uh, extra extra pawn. So white would have to show the um, <clears throat> white would have to show and prove that uh, you know he can win. You know some additional material or uh, uh, overcome that pawn deficit, which I be which I believe again this position is better, because like I said, Capablanca said uh, position first then material, and this is definitely a situation here where White has the two bishops, uh, nice control of the f file, beautiful control over the uh, h1 to a8 diagonal, he can bust open the b file at will by just playing b4. So I think he has full he has full compensation for the pawn, but I think it's a trade off. It's like okay, black has the pawn, white has the position, so that's that's what makes the game equal. However, I would prefer prefer to have the better position than have the pawn. Okay, so here in this position, Pomar plays knight f four. And uh, this this right here is a great um, example of Botvinnik as a tactician. You don't really think of him like that. You know, you always think of players like Tal and stuff like that. But here's a, a good example. Like if you want to pause the computer, pause the video at this point and try to figure it out for yourself what Botvinnik did here. Notice that the knight coming to f4 cuts the relationship off between the two rooks and therefore this rook is attacked by the queen on e7 furthermore this knight is also attacking this queen on h3 so even a move like bishop takes here would still cost um, a white a rook and then if he just captures with the rook then he loses, he would lose in exchange. And that's Arturo Pomar's uh, concept right there in a nutshell. And furthermore, he is threatening Rook takes G2. Check. So how much more can you ask for in a move? Right, so it's, it's hard to knock him for playing it. But, um, okay, so you've had enough time if you wanted to pause the video. Bafinik played a beautiful, beautiful move here. Rook 6 takes f4. Right? Pomar says, okay. He collects. He plays e takes f4. And here's the killer. Look at the king here in the dark square. f4 is a dark square. Bishop takes f4 check. And Pomar resigned. 
Can you see why he resigned? Look at the diagonals pointing toward the king. There's only two moves here. One is to, well, it's actually three moves. One, well, we could get crazy if we want four moves, actually. Ba basically, one idea is to interpose the queen, right, and just drop the queen, protecting against the check. So here's one, two, three moves, so that doesn't really count, right? So dropping the queen. The other move, which is completely natural, is to play king to h8. But notice the position of the knight on d8 blocks the action of the rooks on the back rank. And therefore, black's c8 square is unprotected. And therefore, mate would occur on c8 from the queen. And this is why Pomar resigned. It's either he would lose his queen or he would be checkmated. So that one move that looks so strong, knight f4, is what cost him the game right there. Again, to be fair, just fixing that back rank situation by playing a move like knight c6. And the game would still be going on. Of course, there would maybe rook f7 attacking the queen. And the game would still be going on with our, with our idea of position versus material. This move, excuse me, this move knight d8 that was played earlier driving the queen out did all, had a, um, did a good job protecting the f7 square. So we see its usefulness, but it wind up becoming a tactical liability after this move knight f4. So I hope you enjoyed those two games and I hope you absorbed, uh, what I was trying to pass on about the positional pawn sacrifice. And any questions, uh, please leave them in the comment section below. And also, please like, subscribe, and share the information uh, that's on this channel. And tell your friends. And um, I hope to see you shortly with another exciting chess video. Talk to you later.